um, welcome to this talk. Um, I am the substitute chair. The chair was actually supposed to be Mr. B. M. Pandey, um, but for various reasons he wasn't able to make it, so I'm the substitute chair. But it is um, a pleasure, uh, and I'm really delighted to be presenting this uh, talk and to be chairing this talk. Um, since I've known Garima for a very long time, uh, Garima was a student at the Center of Historical Studies, JNU, where she did her MPhil and her PhD. And after that has done a diploma in archaeology um, and is at present working with the Archaeological Survey of India based in Chandigarh. And she has been with the ASI for um, two. <laughs> Ten years. For more than 10 years, so it's been a long time. Um, I'm also, I would also like to wel welcome, and it's an honor that Professor Thapar is here. Uh, the uh, talk draws on a book um, that Garima has written uh, for Routledge in the series Archaeology, um, uh, um, Archaeology and Religion in, so in Early South Asia. Um, I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Sinha, um, Dr. Chakravarti, uh, for, and uh, to other colleagues from Routledge for being here, um, and we now look forward to the talk by Karima. Karima, the floor is all yours. So much. Good evening, everybody. And uh, as they say, the driest dust that blows is archaeology. But I'll make sure. I'll try my best not to put you all to sleep. Um, the topic. As you can see, is women in monastic Buddhism in early South Asia, uh, rediscovering the invisible believers. Studies on gender and religion discuss women as a single monolithic homogeneous category, thus undermining the agency of many of its members and rendering them invisible within the broader religious discourse. This monograph uses gender as a framework to offer unique insights into the socio-cultural foundations of Buddhism. It highlights the multiple roles played by women as patrons, practitioners, lay and monastic members, etc. within Buddhism. It examines their sustained role in the larger context of South Asian Buddhism and reaffirms their agency. It also investigates the individual experiences of the members and their equations and relationship at different levels with the Sangha at large and with their own respective bhikshu or bhikshuni Sangha with the laity and with members of the same gender, both lay and monastic. It rereads, reconfigures and reassesses historical data in order to arrive at a new understanding of Buddhism and the social matrix within which it developed and flourished. So now let's Excuse me, I think you need to move the mic a little nearer to you. Put it towards your mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is a map of the Buddhist sites that I have largely looked at. It's South Asia. The topic says South Asia, but I have, after my field surveys, I zeroed in on certain sites, and these are some of them. Uh, the issues that I have looked at, the archaeologically in this book are primarily what were the various types of structures that were associated with women, the residential and the non-residential structures. Were stupas erected for women and has this practice survived among the later day Buddhists? Which particular group of women or lay women enjoyed this privilege and the identification of bhikshuni residences? Now when I started work on this thesis, all we heard was talk about, uh, whenever we talked about Buddhist sites, we, we heard about monks and monasteries. There were never bhikshunis or bhikshuni viharikas that we heard about. I had never come across an archaeological, Buddhist archaeological site which was identified as a bhikshuni vihara. So that is uh, where I started. And uh, here we have a comparative chart. This data is based on inscriptional records uh, from all the sites that have been published in archaeological journals. I had compiled all the inscriptions and this is the total number of donors that we get. 
versus women donors. Uh, it doesn't show all the sites, but we have it's a representative, representative uh, figure that we have here, and it has primarily those sites have been put in, which we are going to put in all the sites, but they are, they, they are, these are the sites that have maximum number of females. Now here we have a chart showing men and men donors versus women donors. So at some of the sites the percentage of women donors is almost equal to or maybe even more than men. The female Buddhist patrons that I keep talking about on and on are basically uh, divided into two groups, Bhikshunis and lay women practitioners. Now when we look at this chart, we have Upasikas or the lay donors and Bhikshunis from various Buddhist sites. There are some sites like Amravati where we have a larger number of Upasikas whereas sites like Sachi thank you, whereas at sites like Sachi and Bharut we have a huge number of uh, Bhikshunis. Now this, this, uh, this diagram shows the number of uh, uh, upasikas or lay donors from different sites. We have like uh, Sachi is dis distinctly preferred over the other sites. We have maximum female donations coming from Sachi. This is again for the Bhikshunis. Bhikshunis also had uh, Sachi as their favorite uh, destination and they prefer to donate at Sachi more than anywhere else. Now the female patrons that we talk about are, we have two categories of women. There are real women with that we looked, with that I have tried to look at and then there we have the legendary women. Legendary women are the women that we come across in the historical records like Vishakha, Mahaprajapati, Gautami was the mother of Buddha, Sujata, Amrapali, Yashodhara, etc. We have textual accounts, sculptures and paintings which in which these women figure. And real women, we come to know about these real women from textual accounts, which is uh, very rare. Then we have some rare sculptures of donors, women donors, paintings and inscriptions. Inscriptions is, are largely uh, the, the primary source that we have for uh, real women donors. Um, in sculpture, we see these uh, representations. Where, uh, this is a Mahaprajapati. This is a scene from the Jataka at Sachi, the first one. This is a, a scene, um, conception scene where she is dreaming right before the birth of the Buddha. And in the next one, uh, a sage is making predictions about the infant Buddha. He is carrying the infant Buddha in his arms and there is uh, his mother standing in the background. Then we have uh, a few more depictions of Mahaprajapati Gautami. There is this uh, birth of the nativity scene where she is again differently depicted. Then we have Yashodhara who was uh, the wife of the Buddha. The first is a scene from Gandhara which shows the marriage of uh, Yashodhara and Siddharth. And in the next scene we have the infant uh, Buddha's child Siddhartha who is uh, sitting on the lap and Yashodhara next, sitting next to the Buddha and again she is uh, in this picture uh, she is at the, at the bottom with a child and there again she is kneeling down and praying to the relics of the Buddha it's not exactly relics it's a representation a symbolic representation of the Buddha it's an early uh, stelae and earlier as we all know the Buddha was depicted symbolically so she is shown kneeling there and in in the depiction that we just seen the women have been represented as mothers or as wives and then we have Amrapali the dancer who's, uh, who we find I mean she is a major a significant part of the Buddhist narratives and figures in the biography of the Buddha this is from Aurangabad caves and that's uh, another uh, depiction where uh, Amrapali is shown next to the Buddha 
and this is another Gandhara specimen from Chandigarh Museum. This is uh, not very clear, it's badly eroded, again from Chandigarh Museum, which shows Vishaka. Vishaka now is one of the most uh, <coughs> important uh, female patrons of Buddhism as per our canonical records. Uh, but we have, I mean, so much has been written about her in the records, but we don't see so much of her in the representations. This is one of the rare representations that we have of Vishakha. Uh, she's right here, this one. And uh, this is Sujata offering milk and rice or kheer to the Buddha uh, just before he attained his enlightenment. We have a few more of Sujata, but uh, Vishakha is not very frequently represented. This is a sole representation of a bhikshuni, though she doesn't look like one, but according to our records, this is from one of the annual reports and uh, a very old hazy picture that I have here, and the only one that I could find of a nun or a bhikshuni. She's supposed to be bhikshuni Soma. And this is the only representation of its kind, of a jataka, of a narrative, which has this lady in the center is supposed to be Kujutara, a lay patron who orally recited one of the Itu Vatak is one of the uh, texts or sermons which she transmitted orally, the only uh, one so far known, which was transmitted by a woman entirely. Now, from what we've seen, like it's usually uh, believed that women preferred to identify, Buddhist women preferred, from the inscriptions that we have, we've been told that women prefer to be identified as mothers. But from uh, an analysis of the inscriptions that I have, I have found only around 57.7% uh, 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 of the women prefer to call themselves identify themselves as mothers in their records. Um, a few bhikshunis also identified themselves as mothers. Most of them identified themselves by their native place from where they came from as wives and they had other uh, categories for identifying themselves. Many of them, it's interesting uh, that they identified themselves, they did not need any male relative to you know, identify themselves with. They, in the inscription, they just mentioned the place they came from and their names. Now, uh, coming to the archaeological evidence for female presence of Buddhist sites. Uh, now, we have seen the kind, different women who have been represented, how they prefer to be known in their records. And now, what I have, uh, prim the primary focus of my work has been on archaeological data relating to the presence of women at Buddhist sites and the structures that I have tried to look into are stupas with ayakas, circular structures, bhikshuni viharikas and three room structures. Now the first two here are non-residential structures and the third and the fourth one are residential structures that I'll be talking about. Circular structure. This is a plan of a circular structure. We, we very often come across these at Buddhist sites, but uh, we normally, there's a one line reference to such sites. Uh, among other things, they talk about, we usually come across in the Buddhist, uh, when we talk about Buddhist sites, we talk about uh, viharas, chaityas, uh, stupas, and in an offhand manner, there's a reference, a single line reference to circular structures. But uh, these structures have never before been looked at closely. Now uh, this is the plan of a st uh, circular structure and this becomes uh, significant for my work as we will see later on. There is this circular structure from a site in Andhra, Andhra Pradesh. And according to the excavators, it was known as a guard room. Uh, this is a closer view of a different circular structure from the same uh, site and there was this inscribed, if you can see there's this rectangular um, um, slab lying there and it is an inscribed slab 
which was lying in situ and the inscription which was found here, this is a close up of the rectangular slab and the inscription which was found here reads uh, Chaya Khamba raised in memory of Vam Bhatt, mother of Rudra Purushidatta and daughter of a Mahashatrapa. So this is significant, this is a slab, this is a memorial pillar uh, which was found inside the circular structure which gives us a clue as to what these circular structures were meant for. We find same kind of a memorial slab from another site called Sanhati. It also found down south. And we have these circular structures uh, and they are found all over. Kundupalli is another site in South India, whereas Sanghol is a Buddhist site in Punjab. So we are getting these in all the Buddhist sites in the subcontinent. There is another inscription from Pakistan, Bahawalpur. Uh, the site is known as Suri Vihara. And according to the inscription there also there was this circular structure that was found. And according to the inscription, uh, during the reign of the Maharaja Raja Tiraja Devaputra Kanishk, in the 11th year, on this day, when the Bhikshu Nagdatta, the preacher of the law and disciple of Acharya Dharma, Dhamatrata, the disciples, disciple of the teacher Bhava, raised the staff or the Yashti here in Damana for the mistress of the Vihara or Vihara Swamini, the lay votary or the Upasika Bala Nandi, and her mother, the matron, the wife of Bala, in addition to this foundation of the staff, subsequently given this enclosure. May it be conducive to welfare and happiness of all living beings. So when we look at when we just give me a moment please. This inscription as per my reading records the raising of the staff or Yashti, uh, which is a term used for a memorial pillar along with the foundations of the staff and the enclosure that holds the staff in Damana. That's the ancient name for the site. By Nagdatta himself for the Vihar Swamini, Vihar Swamini or the mistress of the Vihara, who is a lay Upasika. Maybe she was the one who uh, patronized that Vihara. Uh, Bala Nandi, that was her name, and her mother the wife of Bala. The erection of the memorial column or Yashti by the monk Nagdatta for the lay Upasika, uh, the Vihara Swamini of Daman Vihara points to the active participation of the monk's fraternity in honoring and in encouraging distinguished lay patrons who probably formed the main support base for the Sangha within the local communities. This fact is attested by the Sui Vihara inscription of the Kushan period. In my opinion, these two inscriptions put to rest all previous ambiguities related to the nature and significance of circular structures found at Buddhist sites. Now, uh, we, we have heard very often about stupas being erected for the Buddhist monks. But were the stupas erected for Buddhist women too? Stupa, we have, I have, a, uh, during my survey, found stupas that uh, these, these are the literary references that I've come across. There's this stupa which marks the spot commemorating the weeping of Mahamaya, that was his mother, following the Buddha's Mahapari Nirvan. And there's another one dedicated to Hariti, a Buddhist goddess, who was a pro uh, and this is approximately 50 li from Pushkalvati. 50 li, uh, this is a um, unit for distance. Uh, stupa which was located at the site which marked the place where the house of Amrapali existed. Now we have, uh, now this is interesting. First we have Amrapali in the, uh, in the archaeological, in the sculptural records and then there is this literary reference to the site where she lived, where there was this, where um, existed her house, we have a stupa there. Or, according to one song, it was this very place where the aunt of Buddha and other bhikshunis also obtained nirvana. Uh, she is known as Amrapali, she was a courtesan and 
Here we have a stupa which is dedicated to Sujata. This is the first archaeological evidence we have for a female Buddhist. This is in Bodh Gaya. And the stupas that, um, this, this stupa has four projections in the cardinal directions. This is a close up of the stupa and I'm sorry but I cannot show the projections here. But we have similar ones um, which are very often found in Andhra. And these are known as Ayaka type stupas. Now, we, we do come across Ayaka type stupas in our uh, excavation reports on the Buddhist sites, but they have never been gone into detail and uh, these, two, these, are, these are cruciform on ground with projections, as I said, in the four directions. From many such structures, relics have been reported and the reliquary, among other things, have female representations in different forms. Now these have been reported from Piprahava and Lodhya Nandangar in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and they have gold leaves. Among other things they have gold leaves with impressions of female figures. Similar evidence also comes from Nagarjun Konda stupa number 6. There are several stupas reported from Nagarjun Konda and stupa number 6 is uh, something like we, what we just discussed and a gold reliquary with two gold, with two gold coins or medallions embossed with the head of a Greek-like male figure and the other with the head of an Indian lady was found from, among other things from this stupa. Again, there is some kind of a female association with this structure. From Pipra Hava, where uh, we have a similar structure, there was this inscription um, which says, of the brethren of the well-famed one together with their little sisters their children, wives, this is a deposit of relics of the kinsmen of the Buddha, the Blessed One. This interpretation indicates the precedent for the enshrinement of relics of women and children also among, along with that of, that of men. Vikrahava is associated with Vaishali where the first Bhikshuni Sangha with 500 odd Sakya women took vows uh, under the leadership of Mahaprajapati Gautami, that was his mother. She became a nun and, and along with her 500 other women took vows and became nuns. The region is also known for its association with the famous courtesan turned lay Buddhist patron Amrapali. When we look at the evolution of Ayaka type stupas, we have such stupas all over and uh, the ones from Chaneti, Nagarjun Konda, Amravati, Pangoradia, Gyaraspur, etc. belong to the earlier period. And these, uh, this is one of the projections of, uh, from such a stupa. This, uh, this is from the site known as Chaneti in Haryana, where the projections are very simple platforms with pillars. We don't have the pillars anymore here in the picture, uh, which were known as the Ayaka Stambhas. Later on, the projections on the four side became more elaborate and uh, this is a <coughs> picture of a, a, a stupa. I mean, this is uh, not a stupa, this is a bronze representation of such a stupa where we have female depictions all over. This, uh, this kind of stupa with projections is seen in the transitional phase from Udaygiri and Alitgiri which belong to the 6th century AD. The more elaborate structures came to carry niches, which was, uh, this, sorry, this is uh, the third phase which is represented and uh, what we find today in our uh, excavations, I mean we don't find much of these in situ anymore but a few si from a few sites we have uh, sculptures of female deities and representations. Uh, they carry uh, artistic sculptural specimens. These have been reported from sites like Paraspur, Menamati in Bangladesh, Paharpur and Shadikya Dera in Pakistan. Now these Ayaka type stupas are contemporary to sim simple stupas that is without the projections. They occur simultaneously, they are contemporary and these were uh, probably dedications which were made to two different groups. 
the simple ones without the projections were probably for the males and the ones with the projections were for the females. It is not a local phenomena as is, has, is generally believed that it is, we find these from Andhra sites but is spread all over the subcontinent and we find that these Ayaka stupas are located in clusters. Now that this, uh, we've seen the, uh, I'll, I'll show you a map and the most of the inscription come from sites which occur in clusters. The sites which are preferred by females occur in clusters and these Ayaka stupas also are located in sites and they form a cluster. Most of the Ayakas carry inscriptions, majority of which are by female donors. This is the map and if you can see there is this cluster at the bottom, then there is another one in the center. Most of them because of space could not be represented but we have some here. There is this one cluster here and there is another one here and there is one here. So we have four clusters. Uh, the cluster one are the sites which are directly associated with the life of the Buddha. Clusters 2 is in central India from Madhya Pradesh with areas of high concentration of both lay and monastic female donors. This we know from the inscriptions. Cluster 3 is uh, the sites in north, uh, in, uh, in and around Kashmir. And uh, for the north we have a lot of uh, literary references to many famous female Buddhist patrons like Yukadevi and Didda etc. Cluster 4 is the Andhra sites like Nagarjun Konda and Amravati where women of the Ikshivaku dynasty, this is from the historical records again, uh, were staunch supporters and patrons of Buddhism. Now, uh, now I come to the residential structures. Uh, when we look, when we try to look for a Bhikshuni Vihara, the most important things that we need to keep in mind are the security of the inmates observance of some common rituals like oposat etc in the company of monks because most of the rituals were done uh, uh, were carried out for uh, the nuns and the monks together and economic considerations like the sharing of the proceeds of dan made to the sangha uh, the identification of a bhikshuni vihar is based on the location of the site the shape or architectural plan of the monastic site and the associated antiquarian remains from the site. This is the site of Kushinagar and there is this, uh, <coughs> there's this monastery uh, in the far eastern corner, Monastery E. Now, This monastery, uh, the pres it has a, a covered space inside. Normally, when we look for a, when we look at the plan of a Buddhist vihar, it is a circular structure with rooms or cells on the four sides, and there's this open courtyard in the center, which is known as, I mean, the architectural plan of such a structure is known as a chatur shala. But here, this uh, the courtyard was supposed to be a closed structure. The presence of a covered space or hall instead of the usual roofless courtyard normally seen in monastic plans can be further explained when we assume that this space was used for periodic congregation when all the bhikshunis gathered for a posad or ordination in the presence of one or more monks. Such an architectural arrangement would offer additional privacy to the residents of the convent, especially in the event of a periodic religious gathering. This would further explain the curious circumstance of the situation of the entrance of Monastery E away from the central group of monuments. Its entrance is also, uh, one has to go all around to get inside the uh, monastery. The associated antiquities from the site include where earthen wares with female representations of them. Now, uh, monks were told to stay away from anything feminine and uh, so as not to corrupt them. So I don't think they would need to have wares with female depictions on them in their monasteries. So that's again another reason 
why I feel this could be a monastery. Next is Nagarjun Konda site number 6 and 8. This is uh, site number 6 where we have this circular structure on top within the same complex and there is this uh, Vihara at the bottom. The monastery was enclosed within an enclosure wall. An open area might have served as a convenient place for washing and bathing for the monks and for the pictionaries. There is an open area also inside, there is no bathroom and that is significant because when we look at the um, well, rules that were made for the pictionaries, they were not supposed to have bathrooms. So here inside the, inside the monastery we have this open uh, area with, which could be used for washing and cleaning. Next is this uh, monastery here, uh, G and F. These are twin monasteries which are joined together by a thick wall and uh, uh, according to one of the Chinese pilgrims, it was, uh, who, who, sorry, a Chinese pilgrim men mentions that, uh, they, they're the, that there were instances of monasteries where uh, monks and uh, nuns stayed together. And we have such a monastery here from Shravasti in Uttar Pradesh. The eastern gate of the site and the road leading to it are contemporary. The, there's, there was this gate here at the bottom and this is the easternmost corner. And there were two sides to the gate. Uh, there were two gates to the side. And the gate here, which was right next to Monastery F, which the, uh, and we found a road and the road, the gate and the monastery, all three are contemporary and from there was found a, a sculpture of a bodhisattva from the Kushan period with a dedication inscribed on its pedestal which, which says Vikshuni Raji Raji Danam, the gift of Nan Raji. This is the plan of the site Shravasti and here we have, this is the area where we have uh, found that monastery and again this is the area where Vishaka made one, um, what do you call it, a monastery and uh, we have so many f structures that have been identified with female Buddhist patrons in and around uh, the site. Now, from Sanati, from where we found one of those rectangular uh, uh, representations, we have found a double enclosure wall. There is provision for a chamber-like curtain wall also that provides additional security and regulates entry into the inside. And there are two ancient bathing guards that have been found during explorations at Sanati. First of these lies close to Stupa 1. and the associated complex. There is uh, little need and justification for the construction of a bathing heart exclusively for the community of monks. This brings to mind again the injunction that Vikshunis were not to make use of bathing hearts that were frequented by men. This would also explain the existence of two, two guards in the same area. We have one here and the other one is here. So two guards in the vicinity were not required unless they were used for by two different groups of people. Now there is this another site in Punjab, Sangol, uh, where we find there is a distinct demarcation between the areas of public activity, that is the stupa where people from outside also came, and the monastery which was for the inmates. There are remnants of a walled enclosure around the assembly area which was meant for people coming from outside and the presence of a covered hall or space inside the usual roofless courtyard normally seen on monastic plans can be explained when we assume as was seen from uh, one of the earlier slides that this space was used for periodic congregation when all the viction is gathered for posat, ordination etc in the presence of one or more monks. 
The stupa is located outside the monastery. Now we have another site uh, around almost 500 meters away from uh, the site that I'm talking about where the stupa is inside the monastery. And here the monastery and the stupa area is demarcated and there's a wall in between. And there's a separate entry to the stupa from the monastic area here. This is the plan. Uh, this is the stupa that I'm talking about. And the, uh, here's the circu circular structure. And this is the area where we have monastic remains. So it is all divided. There was a wall which separated the monastic area from the stupa area. Now, uh, the last structure that I'm discussing are the three roomed structures which have again not been referred to and uh, there are some three or four sites from where such structures have been reported. Um, one of them is Sangol and the three room structure is very close to the monastic remains. The others are Ita Mundia and Bakroor and Ratnagiri. It consists of three rooms with a veranda in the front and it was built on the ruins of an earlier monastery which had the same plan which means that the three room structure continues for a very long time. Earlier the mound, uh, the, the three room structure here is from Ratnagira Giri where, uh, uh, where a copper plate charter was found of a Somavanshi king. Uh, this is the 11th, 12th century, which records the grant of a village to Rani Karpura Shri, who was from the Solanapur Mahavihar, the site from which, uh, the site of which is probably represented by Solanapur near Jajpur, 13 miles from Ratnagiri in Odisha. Similar structures, as I said, have uh, been reported from Sangol. Ita Mundi is another site near Ratnagiri in Odisha, and Bakraor. Where, uh, right next to the stupa which was dedicated to Sujata. Now, I have, I, I don't think there will be time to discuss all the architectural plans that I have looked at, but this is a table of all the uh, structures which I think could be Bhikshani Viharas. And if you look at this table, most of the sites are found in the eastern or the southeastern uh, area of the Buddhist site. All the Bhikshuni Viharas so far have <coughs> been identified. The presence of most of the Bhikshuni Viharas at the easternmost extremity of the site suggests that these residences for the Bhikshunis was constructed as per some predetermined architectural <coughs> site plan. Women could pursue a religious career but within a carefully regulated institutional structure. This would entail strictly adhering to prescribed spatial layout for the nunneries in one particular direction. It could also mean that the women members of the Sangha enjoyed a position where they could negotiate for the most favorable location for the Viharas. As we know, most of the Buddhist and the other Hindu temples uh, also are located in the east or they have, uh, or they're east facing and one enters from the west, the idols or the Garbhagrihas are in the east. So summing up, uh, we come across the concept of pollution and purity which is associated with the female in Buddhism very often and finds mention in the canonical works. Now these get corrected by the archaeological data and indicate that the female element within Buddhism was not just equated with profanity. Accommodating such structures within the sacred complex indicate, on the one hand, a recognition of the religious and spiritual advancement of the female members, both lay as well as monastic, and on the other, a tacit compromise between the different members within the Sangha. And the data for the female presence comes almost from the same <coughs> sites. The Buddhist society, as we can see, if they're giving them space and they're giving them space in the east, I think they know. And there are so many structures uh, that are associated with the feminine. I think they know they are in no way indifferent to the issues of gender in women. And the subject was part of the larger social religious debate within Buddhism. 
the active participation and agency of Buddhist women in religious, spiritual and social matters uh, prevented the society from remaining unresponsive to their presence and there was distinct religious identity for both the sexes within Buddhism and the Bhikshuni Sangha developed parallel to the mainstream Buddhist dominated Sangha which is brought out in the archaeological records. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for uh, this uh, interesting talk and what I liked was your survey of the archaeological material um, which is uh, which I thought drew out the uh, way in which certain structures were associated with women. Uh, I think certain questions remain. You never explained why we should associate three-roomed uh, structures with women. I mean, what is so special about three-roomed structures and women? That was one that I had. Uh, before I open the, the, uh, the questions uh, to the floor, uh, the second that I had was um, uh, what we see are um, a scattering of associations, um, say, you know, one monastery um, located looking to the east within a larger complex. So where would you, where would you sort of really place women uh, from the, I mean, I do, I do, um, I do uh, certainly um, take the point that archaeologists have not looked at these structures, so what we have are only, you know, what we can find because that's not been a concern of the archaeologists, nor has reporting been um, that detailed to be able to talk about women in Buddhism. Uh, but would you, would you like to comment on, uh, on at least these two aspects? On the first one, uh, as I said, these three room structures have been found at three or four sites which have um, come up with evidences in more ways than one. Okay. association with the females and then from this site in Ratnagiri there was this copper plate charter mm -hmm. which was found from the area from where the three room structure has been reported and it mentions that it was uh, that uh, they are making a grant mm -hmm. for the uh, for Rani Karpura Shri okay. so that is the connection that I thought was made mm -hmm. and again at Sangol we have this structure which is uh, uh, we have these two structures, the monastic remains, which I think is a Bhikshuni Vihara and the circular structure. And right next to them is this three-roomed structure again. And we have, uh, now most of these structures, the circular structures and the three-roomed structures, uh, from uh, whatever inscriptional uh, data I found, have been associated with lay Buddhist women. I see. Okay. And from Sangol, we have this cultural representation of Kujutala, who is again, an ideal lay Buddhist okay. patron. So I think uh, that's where the connection can be made. Thanks. Uh, yeah, questions please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Sandhya Jain. I'm a journalist. I wanted to know that uh, what kind of proportion did you find in your architectural, uh, archaeological uh, uh, survey about the uh, male uh, Vihara, the male uh, uh, monks, these are the female monks, what would be the proportion? And secondly, uh, I don't think you have done anything on Nalanda. But Nalanda it, also I have, I haven't shown it okay. here. Yes. Did you find evidence that when there was iconoclasm and the destruction of the monasteries, were there female monastery structures in those places also? Uh, yes, the structure that I have found from Nalanda is a late uh, structure. It's uh, 11th century to be precise. And we have uh, evidence of female presence there at that time. And that was the time when uh, Buddhism was moving towards the east. And that is the time when we have more evidences of female presence coming from the eastern side. As for proportion, I wasn't very clear. You, uh, I mean, if they would, if the Vihan side said they were a hundred male monks in one, how many females would they be at that time? Would they be ten? Would they also be hundred? The the structures that I've discussed uh, are normally. I mean, when you look at uh, say Shravasti, when you look at the monastic remains from that side, there are say suppose uh, five or seven monastic uh, viharas for the monks. The one that I thought 
was uh, for females has uh, comparatively fewer rooms and uh, they are smaller in size and they have additional privacy aspects to them. So essentially um, fewer, but that is also, you know, that's also a, 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 an issue which relates to the way in which archaeology is done. That if you haven't looked for uh, nunneries or, you know, places where the Kuni stayed, um, then that is not what would be reported. Uh, so is, I mean, are we seeing uh, what you said, are we seeing then fewer or um, a handful of women in a larger uh, no, they are not as few as uh, we see in the archaeological records. Another thing which I have not been able to bring in here were the avasas or the temporary structures that have that find mentioned in the uh, literary records. These were temporary structures uh, as in they were not made of bricks. They have not survived. And more of uh, these Buddhist women, the nuns, I think were accommodated in the avasas because uh, of many reasons, so primarily it could be because of economic constraints and the Bhikshuni Sangha was not getting the kind of donations which the male Sangha was getting at that time. It's still the case as, I mean, if you look at the Bhikshuni, uh, Bhikshuni organizations in the north, I went to Dharamshala, there also they have these financial constraints as of now. So I think they must have faced this long back also and um, they would have to make do with um, these avasas and most of the nuns also stayed on with their um, family. They did not leave their houses and they keep, continued to stay with their family. So that's another reason why we don't see so much of archaeological evidence relating to nuns. Um, other questions? Okay. Yeah. कई बार जब हमें बता सकते हैं कि मतलब जो हमको नजरिए मिलती हैं, तो उनका कल्चर सीक्वेंस में तब सबसे पुराना एविडेंस कहाँ से मिलता जो हम एक्सप्रेस जैसे बुद्ध ने मना किया था कि नंस को नहीं लाना है बहुत ही मतलब बिहार आज या फिर धर्म में, तो हमें कब से एविडेंस मिलते हैं नजरिए बनने के और सबसे the, I think the earliest evidence that we have for nunneries is from Bairat. The monastic remains in Bairat are the earliest that can be, in my opinion, which can be identified with a Vikshuni Vihara. तो हमारे डायरेक्टर ने शायद उसको अभी नजरीज के रूप में उनके विचार है कि नजरीज भी हो सकता है ऐसे ही स्वास्तिक सेब का हमको शिरपुर में भी आके एक ही समाज को मिला और नालंदा में भी क्या स्वास्तिक टाइप के जो बिहार होते थे क्या उससे हम रिएशोशिएट कर सकते हैं क्या नजरीज को ऐसा कुछ प्रमाण कह सकते हैं but I'm still looking at it and uh, I mean, I still need to see that one, yes. Uh, but how long do they continue? You said Bhairat was the <coughs> earliest, but then you said Nalanda was up to 11th century, we do get... Uh, 11th, 12th century, yes. So, uh, right through, so right through. So right through. Yes. Yeah. And is there any air, you did show clusters and you said, you know, that you are four clusters. Yes, um, so are there any areas where horizontally we, we see uh, more women participating or that's hard to say. I mean, we have clusters of uh, what you showed us uh, were, you know, right through the country. Uh, no, the question I'm asking is that if we look at the distribution of sites uh, across the board, um, horizontally, um, are there certain areas of the subcontinent where um, uh, structures associated with women are more prominent than other areas. Yes, definitely the cluster that I spoke about uh, have all the four kinds of structures occurring simultaneously in a, in a certain period. And this is there throughout the subcontinent. We have it in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, it's, ha it's all over. And it ha they're occurring right through. I mean, um, when we 
you look at Bairat, Bairat is I think uh, the structures there is 1st century BC mm -hmm. and from there right in the 12th century the 12th BC we are getting these structures. or um, well everybody agrees with you. Do you find any ref re references to why these women became monks? Because Buddha himself had to allow the women to become now in his own lifetime. Yeah, when uh, there are these poems of these Buddhist nuns, the Theri Gatha is one yeah. of them. And uh, it has references to various women who entered Buddhism because of various reasons. Yeah. And they, it is very interesting when you look at the poems because there's so much of, uh, um, they are very independent women, mentally they are very strong and they have their own rights and reasons and they are justifying themselves in the poems and uh, I mean there's no one specific reason which made them nuns and it was, and there was no forcing them not to or to join but they have their own reasons to join and we have evidences to a lot of the poems primarily are the basic reference to women and their reasons to join the Sangha. They have written about their lives and what made them get into Buddhism. They never ever say that they had problems. After all, when people like Why don't you speak in the mic, please? Yeah. If people have problems living in families which are small and all, and then they <laughs> leave and enter a larger Sangha, do they really get along? There are references and there are rules that were made for the nuns. Um, there must have been friction and there must have been fights. And to regulate all of that and to maintain peace and order within the Sangha, there are rules that have been made. And uh, there have been rules that we talk, when, whenever we look at Buddhism, we look at all the rules, the extra rules that were made for the women. And that is how we look at them and we say that they are. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> this is patriarchy and why the extra rules for the women. But when I started looking at the architectural aspect, I realized that the, those, the addition, most of the additional rules that were made had nothing to do with patriarchy. It was all very practical and they were needed at that time. The security was needed. Most of the rules that were made for the nuns like uh, they are not going out in the open and they could not stay in the forests all by themselves like the monks. All these were rules that were made to facilitate the nuns and to take care of the security. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you actually, I've been doing some work on the victories but in Southeast Asia, mostly in Thailand actually. Okay. And I wanted to know if you had any in your work come across any evidence because from my understanding in uh, Burma, Thailand, uh, Laos, you know there's been actually no evidence or all that ev evidence has been um, kind of hidden or uh, you know it's inaccessible of earlier Bhikshuni Sankhas in that region. So I was wondering if you know in terms of your work whether you have come across anything from that part of the world. As of now, I have only concentrated on South Asia, but uh, yes, Thailand, contemporary Thailand, we have uh, this uh, this notion of pollution and purity is very entrenched and women cannot circumambulate the stupa, they cannot go around it and worship it, and like they can in the other countries as in India and Sri Lanka, but there, it's still there, I'm sure you know about it, but as for the archaeological references, I haven't looked at them as yet. I plan to. But you haven't come across anything in your uh, uh, work? No. Yeah. Uh, contemporary Thailand, yes, I've looked at, but nothing uh, historical. Um, well, if um, there are no other questions, um, I think we'd like to thank Garima for um, giving us um, this uh, peep or insight into her book and into her work. Um, and uh, we look forward to the book as it appears from Routledge and we do hope that she will continue this work and uh, hopefully find, uh, find a site where one can excavate with great care and uh, you know, get the evidence that it has so far been lacking. Um, so we wish you luck and thank you everybody for coming and uh, for uh, participating in the discussion.
Thank you. Thank you.